Peter, thank you very much. A piece of detective work certainly makes it um, makes it very real. Um, next up, I'm, I'm delighted we're, we're very lucky to have our next speaker with us this evening, um, Dr. Pat McCarthy. Pat has uh, travelled all the way from Sandymount. Um, but first and foremost, Pat is and always will be a Waterford man. I'm actually an old neighbour of Pat's and married to a Waterford girl. And every time Pat meets Cody, he says, Why are you married to a weed man? Um, and his only, the only saving grace is that I'm not from Kilkenny. Um, so we're still talking. Uh, Pat is Secretary of the Military History Society of Ireland. Um, he was educated um, in Waterford in Men's Science, CBS, and at UCD, where he graduated with his BSc and a PhD in Chemistry. He uh, subsequently uh, earned an MBA and uh, enjoyed a very successful career in the pharmaceutical manufacturing industry. So without any further ado, Pat's going to talk to us about the connection between Castlenock and the uh, Fusiliers. Thanks, Gordon, for that introduction. How much would I do? I merit it, I don't know. The Castlenock men in the Dublin Pals. First of all, a word to say what a Pals unit actually was. When England declared war on August the 4th and Kitchener was appointed the, uh, Minister, the Secretary of State for War, he appealed for volunteers. And even though he didn't need to, because there was such a huge response, he himself got this idea of encouraging groups of men, and as he said, enlist together, you will train together, you will mess together, and you will fight the common enemy together. And that concept took on a life of its own. So up and down the length and breadth of Great Britain, groups of men, sometimes on a geographical basis, you had the Grimsby Chums, the Liverpool Pals, the Manchester Pals, would join up together and move off to war, sometimes forming a complete battalion of 1,100 men, sometimes 250 men in a company. And it wasn't just on a geographical basis, in London, for the Middlesex Regiment, you had the Post Office Pals, you had the Civil Service Pals. You even had a couple in Edinburgh, the Hearts of Midlodium Pals. You had to be a fan of the Hearts Football Club to be, to be allowed to join this particular battalion. It was very successful in getting recruits, but it had a downside. And that became obvious on the first day of the song. You take a town like Accrington in Lancashire, which had formed the Accrington Pals, and on the first day of the song, on the first day of July, 1916, 245 men of that battalion were killed, and another 400 injured. And just take the devastating impact on a relatively small town when the telegrams came through, 245 killed and almost 400 wounded on that day. Now, there was no effort initially to set up Dublin PALs or PALs units in Ireland. But one man, Frank Browning, Frank Browning was the president of the Irish Rugby Football Union. And a week after the outbreak of war, he appealed to members of the Rugby Football Union clubs to form a home defence unit, what he called the Irish Rugby Football Union Regiment. Within a week, he had over 300 men <coughs> drilling for home defence. They were not members of the army. This was almost like a volunteer unit not associated with the army, or not formally part of the army at this stage. But a Colonel Downing, who was setting up the 7th Battalion of the Dublin Fusiliers, 
saw an opportunity and he issued an appeal. I'm keeping my battalion open for you to join. He appealed directly to the Irish Rugby Football Volunteers. I am waiting for you, but I cannot keep open long. Come at once today. A few days later, there was a recruiting meeting in Lansdowne Road, or should I say the Aviva? It certainly wasn't the Aviva at that stage. Um, and you can see them there, the ones who volunteered. Now, some of them were turned down on grounds of age are not being fit. Fit enough to play rugby, but not fit enough to join the army. They would later form what were called the City of Dublin Volunteers, or what the locals called them, the Gorgeous Rex, who had a small but tragic part in 1916 when Frank Browning was killed. The next day, 250 of them marched through the streets of Dublin heading for the Curragh. They had signed up. And they reached the Curragh, they entrained to Newbridge, marched to the Curragh, and on the first night, they got their first taste of army cuisine, and they got their evening meal, which we are told was tea served in buckets, one large piece of bread, and a choice, margarine or jam. That was their introduction to army cuisine. Now, in that 250, in that 250 men that marched down to the current that day in September 1914, we know there were at least nine Castlenock men. Harold Brooks from, from Killarney. His parents ran a hotel in Killarney and he had um, gone to school here in Castlenock. At the outbreak of the war, he was the assistant purser on a merchant ship for the Allen Line. James Donovan in the centre there was born in Dawkey. When he finished in Castle Lock, he was working as a clerk in the National Bank and he was also playing cricket for the Leinster Cricket Club. Cecil Claude Keller. He had been born in New Jersey. <coughs> the family had returned to Ireland and he had gone here to school to Castle Knock. He must have left school relatively early because he too was a, a cadet in the Mercantile Marine and he was only 17 when he joined up in 1914. Possibly he lied about his age because they were supposed to be 18. Um, Francis McGillicott was born in Listowel, County Kerry. That's him there. Patrick Marr was born in Roscommon. Um, he was a civil servant in the Land Registry Office. Patrick Marr was a clerk in the Hibernian Bank. And Edward or Michael Moran was a governor, graduated from UCD, and he was a civil servant in the Land Registry Office. Edward Nolan is described in the records as a gentleman farmer. He was 29 when he joined up, he was from County Carlow, and he was possibly one of the oldest in the company, the Pals, the D Company of the 7th Dublin Fusiliers. Gareth O'Sullivan, here, he was the son of a Dr. O'Sullivan uh, from Ball's Bridge, and he too remarkably was serving with the Mercantile Marine. And finally, Thomas Whitty, born in Waterford, son of a Dr. P.J. Whitty, who himself was a past pupil of Castle Knock. He was one of four sons of Dr. Whitty who joined up. Two of them would be killed in the family. But Thomas was the only one who joined the Dublin Pals. He was also a member of Lansdowne Rugby Club and one of his uncles was a member of the Vincentian Order and apparently was on the staff here of the college for some time. So these are the guys, the nine Castle Knock men, who marched down to the Curragh on that day in September. Training started. 
They were slow to get uniforms, such as the demand. But by October, November, they are really being knocked into shape. In December, they returned to Dublin for musketry training in Doddy Mount. Inexperienced recruits are always advised to fire out to sea. Much safer for everybody around them. <laughs> um, but there wasn't no only musketry training. This is a remarkable picture I thought when I saw it first. The rugby team of D Company of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, March the 5th, 1915. I don't know if there are any cast up men among them, but what struck me is the rugby team, there are actually 30 players there. That's not fair. <laughs> on that. But by now, the unit is taking shape. It's part of the 10th Irish Division. And you can see it's there in the 30th Brigade, the 6th Royal Dublin Fusiliers, the 7th. The 10th Division was a truly, totally 32 county division. It had men from every part of the country. The Royal Irish Rifles from Belfast, the Royal Irish Regiment from my neck of the woods, the Connacht Rangers, the Leinsters, the Inniskillings. It had all the Irish regiments. In March, it moved to England to get ready for final training. And at the beginning of June, it was inspected by King George V, and the following day, it was inspected by Lord Kitchener. That was a sure sign that they were going to be moved overseas, that they were now deemed to be ready. And they all expected to go to France. But towards the end of June, as they were doing their final training, the rumour got around they were heading for the Middle East. And on the 18th of June, they were entrained, brought down to Southampton, and when they saw tropical clothing being loaded with them, they knew they were heading for the Dardanelles. Now, a word about the Dardanelles, just to put it in, in background. If any country wanted to be neutral, it was Turkey. Turkey, before the war, was bankrupt. It had lost three wars in the previous three years. It had a coup d'etat, and it wanted to be neutral. But a combination of imperial greed, total arrogance, and a fair degree of racism by the French and by the British and by the Russians ensured that Turkey entered the war on the side of Germany and Austria-Hungary. So, Churchill devised a campaign to drive Turkey out of the war. The Royal Navy would sail a battle squadron up the Dardanelles, into the Sea of Marmara, up towards Istanbul or Constantinople, and there they would expect the Turks to surrender. If they didn't surrender, they would bombard a defenseless city that was crammed with refugees. Only problem, the Turks had defences there at what, what they call the Narrows. So they sent in some Royal Naval ships on February 11th, which bombarded an old fort, destroyed it, and they said, well, this is easy. So having given the Turks warning, they gave the Turks time to prepare. So five weeks later, on March the 18th, they sailed a massive fleet of 18 battleships plus others up the year to bombard those forts. Partly successful. So they came back the next day. But the Turks had planted some mines. What did I do wrong? Mines. Mines. <laughs> in the little village of Canacale, there's a replica ship, a glorified trawler at best. And that's the little ship that came down that night, planted the mines, and the next day, four battleships were sunk. Very, very productive. 
The Royal Navy retreated back out and said, let the army go in. So again they waited. And it was not until the middle of April, April the 24th, that they landed. And the Irish units in particular, not the 10th, took some awful casualties. It's sobering to stand over the little cove of Sudan Bar and to think of the sea awash with Irish bodies. There was a Lieutenant Commander Samson who was in the Royal Naval Air Service and he left a description of flying his plane up that morning, up from out here, up towards Sudan Bar. And he describes the sea as faintly pink. And it gets darker as he gets nearer the land. When he comes near the bay, the sea is red and it's covered with floating bodies, Irishmen. But the whole idea was that the Allies would advance up. They expected to capture that little village of Critia within one or two days. They never did. They spent five weeks battering away trying to capture it. It cost them 60,000 casualties. Now I remember when I was there, a Turkish officer, and he said, it cost the Allies 60,000 casualties and they didn't get four kilometers and it was another 240 kilometers to Istanbul. So it had failed. So the war cabinet then decided what do we do next? Really they had three choices. Withdraw. Churchill said no we can't withdraw. We cannot admit to being beaten by an inferior race. Continue on. Or launch another attack, another landing. And that's where the 10th Irish Division comes in. There were, that's Anzac. There was a land on this plane here, on these beaches. Attack across. And the order from Sir Ian Hamilton was, by nightfall, capture the high ground. And once we have that high ground, we have it won. We can cut across the peninsula, we have it won. But move and move quickly. Get across. That's the plane. I was down there in September. It was roasting hot. In August, the temperature in the daytime gets up to 40 degrees. There's no cover, there's no shelter. It's a very sobering place to go. It's exactly as it was then. Nothing has changed. Tiny little tracks. You can't get a car down there. You walk. You see little horse-drawn carts. A few little pieces of cultivation. A few little areas of green that will come back to you. And above all, the heat in it. And the plant, and in the middle, there's a great big salt lake. The ridge over there at the beginning of the high ground. And the plan was fairly simple. The Irish 10th Division would land here, capture the ridge and move around. The 11th Division would land here and move around. Very, very simple. Very straightforward. They're going to land about 25,000 troops and they will be opposed by about 1,500 Turks, half of whom were policemen. So on paper, what would go wrong? Well, it went wrong. First of all, this is where the 10th Division should have landed. This is where it landed. It landed in the wrong place right on top of the 11th Division. Result, utter and total chaos. Instead of units were getting mixed up, they landed at about 6 o'clock in the morning. By about half 11, they had got themselves sorted out from the mess. And then the second problem began to manifest itself. One that would haunt 
the survivors forever. The army had assumed the navy would deliver water supplies. The navy had assumed that the army would dig wells. They were short of water in 40 degrees heat. And inexperienced troops like the Irish were, they had been issued a quart of water that was to last them two days. A lot of them had it drunk by midday. And that's the one memory that would stick for so many of them, the thirst. But anyway, they got themselves sorted and began to move up that way, across the entrance to the lake, had to capture Hill 10, and then had to coordinate with the 11th. They were attacking that hill, Chocolate Hill. They didn't really get going on their attack until about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. One of the Dublin Fusiliers recorded Young Keller, remember Keller was a Castle boy. Young Keller and I were together and running for a ditch. Flung myself down with Keller. The bullets hit the ground less than a yard away. A scrap of cover saved me. The others were riddled. I think that Brooks was hit at that time in the body. He was not found until the next day and died very shortly afterwards on a hospital ship. The first of the Castle boys to die at so at so little. Patrick Marr, another Kastanok boy, was badly wounded that day as well. By the time they captured Chocolate Hill, it was 8 o'clock, and the Turks had brought up reinforcements. They would not get much further. And for the next two days, the Dublin Fusiliers were dug in around Chocolate Hill as the Turks counterattacked and pinned them down. After two days of that, they were withdrawn, and above all, those two days stuck in the memory of the Dublin Fusiliers, not the monsters who were with them, for the thirst, the heat, the lack of water. And to make it worse, the rations they'd been issued, they'd been issued with three days' rations, were tins of bully beef. And such was the heat that a lot of them recorded that when they opened the tin, the bully beef was a liquid mass, inedible, and attracted thousands of flies. So they were suffering from hunger, suffering from thirst. Supply situation had collapsed completely on those first couple of days. Still they hung on, and after a couple of days, they were withdrawn to reserve. They got two days rest, and then they were committed to another attack. The ridge on the side, Kirich Tepe. It's a typical mountain ridge, covered in shrub, rocks, and um, you could not dig trenches there. Some of the records of others record the only shelter you could get was to use as a parapet, to use as a shelter, the dead body of a comrade. And as one of them, as Francis Morrow, in another unit, when he beat the castle not past pupil, recorded, the heat did its dreadful work very quickly on the corpses. On the 16th of August, they attacked up that hill, trying to reach the top where the Turks were waiting for them. They managed to reach the top but were driven off. And in that attack, Cecil Keller and Thomas Whitty were both killed and Garth O'Sullivan was wounded. There was bitter fighting all that night. They had attacked at midnight and all that night there was attack and counter-attack between themselves and the Turks. By daybreak, 11 officers and 54 men had been killed from D Company. And, put, and D Company, which had landed with 239 officers and men, now had 108 fit for service. And that's where, on that hill, is where D Company would spend the next four weeks taking casualties, giving casualties. After about two weeks, both sides gave up attack. It was useless. 
Turks couldn't drive them back into the sea. The Allies couldn't make any further progress. So, as one said, you cannot tell the wounded or the dead from the living. The dead are everywhere about the parapets, and the sun does its work quickly. It is hot as hell in the day and cold as the Kerry Mountain at night. At last, then, on the 25th of September, the Dublin Fusiliers, including D Company of the Pals, were withdrawn. The 10th Division was going to Salonika. Of the 239 men who landed with D Company, the Dublin Pals, 79 were unscathed. The rest were either dead or wounded or missing. The cost for the Castlenock men, Aaron Brooks died of wounds, Thomas Whitty missing, killed in action, Cecil Keller missing, killed in action, Patrick Maher severely wounded, Garth O'Sullivan wounded, he would later be commissioned into it as an officer into the Royal Irish Rifles. Many of them had contracted fever from the conditions, and Edward Nolan died of fever on the 2nd of March 1917. Overall, the 10th Division had lost 2,000 men killed in those seven weeks, most of them in the first eight or nine days as they landed. In many ways, it was the end of the Dublin Palace. Aaron Brooks is buried at Capella Cemetery. As far as I know, the bodies of Keller and Whitty were not recovered. That's Asmac Cemetery, one of the few green spots on that plain at Sulda, and where most of the unidentified bodies are buried. It is possible they are buried there, but that is their memorial. As we heard earlier, the type of memorial where it simply says, a British soldier or an Irish soldier, known unto God. So I offer those few words as a tribute to the Castlenock Powells in the Dublin Fusiliers. Thanks very much. Expected. That was fascinating, and thanks for all the work that went into that. Um, much, if not all, of that is, is unique research that has gone in to make the connection between the school and, and the D Company, and it was a privilege to listen to it. So, thanks, Pat, for doing all that work. Um, so, at, at this stage of the evening, um, 